What's going on, Patrick? What's up there, Ron, man? Oh, man, it's good to be back here in the studio. We have an amazing, amazing show. I am totally fanboying out right now. I'm geeking out a bit. I got one of my my guys. I've been wanting to get on here. I did not think he was going to say yes because our little bitty podcast. And he said, yes, he gave us a, a shot and he's going to be on the show. I am crazy going cr nuts right now. He's one of our biggest guests. I am so excited to announce Mr. Proud, uh, John Proudstar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, man, you, you and me both, bro. I'm telling you what. You could take well, DC and Marvel and put it in the pocket, and we've got our own native superhero. <laughs> Powered by Spam. Uh, and Commodity Cheese. Brought to you and by Commodity Spam Cheese. This podcast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, that's what I'm saying, dude. He showed his collection, too. we got to bring this man on, you know. I was... We, we normally do news, but we are going to bring our guest right on. He's limited on time because he's a busy guy, but we want to say welcome to Mr. John Santanta, proud star. Oka! Hey. Oka! <laughs> just to give it, let me, guys, before we even have John speak, I want just to read out his resume a little bit. My native people, if you watch native movies, this guy's been on just about everything native people watch. Every native person out there has a has a library. So just to name a few, because it took me a book, just a few. Uh, Mr. John Prowstar has has acted in over forty six different roles, including two producing roles and two directing roles. Jesus Christ! This goes back to nineteen eighty nine when he appeared in uh, Billy the Kid. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm pulling I'm pulling out some dates there, John. Uh, as well as most native people, especially us country boys, watch Walker, Texas Ranger. He appeared in Walker, Texas Ranger, uh, Cowboys and Indians, uh, Skinwalkers, the movie, as well as the TV series. Uh, there's one of his latest uh, movies I got to watch last night, which is available right now on Amazon, which is The Year of the Dog. Fantastic movie. He stars in that movie with uh, the, one of the Spears brothers, Michael Spears, one of the oh greatest hand drum singers that dude has got a voice um yeah. and we most most recently of course all of us tv addiction we're the award-winning show reservation dogs as willie jack's father welcome so much john <laughs> oh, God, hey. Hey, hey, good to be here fight with chuck norris too what <laughs> you get in a fist fight with chuck norris eh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chuck, was, Chuck was actually really cool guy. I got to talk to him about Bruce Lee. I told him I was a huge Bruce Lee fan. And uh, during one of our breaks, you know, he invited me into his trailer and we talked about Bruce Lee and he told me all these personal stories about Bruce. So that was amazing, you know, just to hear about who Bruce was from a guy who knew him, you know, who was like his buddy. So, yeah. One of his first students, from my understanding, my dad was big on Bruce Lee, you know what I mean? And Chuck Norris, too. You know what I'm saying? But there was all these memes on Facebook for the longest time, like, don't mess around oh, yeah. with Chuck, you know what I mean? But, and then we started talking more as, like, you know, thinking about martial artists and superheroes in the Native community, and it got me to thinking about Billy Jack, which you said a moment ago, that would that's the namesake of Willie Jack, your yeah. on-air personality's daughter. Now that that's got to be a cool connection, huh? Yeah, no, it was pretty cool when Sterling told me about the part and told me about Little Willie Jack. It was hard for me to get a mental image, but then when I met her, I'm like, oh my god, this is her. <laughs> <laughs> I love what she said when she was on the. I think it was Tonight Show. She said they wanted Res Kids, they got Res Kids, and I was oh, like, yeah. oh my god, that was real. No, it's no joke. Some of these kids were literally pulled off the street. Uh, their aunties made them go. And, you know, they were kind of mad because they didn't want to do it. And then some of them became breakout stars because their aunties forced them to go to this audition. Yeah. Well, so There's a lesson, kids. Listen to your aunties. They know best. Listen right. to your aunties. And finish your food at the table. Don't be fighting around. And otherwise, she'll make you sit there for two and a half hours, even when it's cold. Well, as soon as you finish it, I suppose you can go play outside. <laughs> Not only does John act, direct, and produce, he's also a huge comic book creator. 
I just <laughs> found this out just recently. You have an, a comic book in the Smithsonian. Could you yes. talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, it's Tribal Force. Uh, Tribal Force came out in 1996. It had been something I'd always wanted to do um, because, you know, the lack of heroes. And when I was a little kid, you know, picking up X-Men and I saw Thunderbird and I was so excited that, oh, you know, hey, we finally got an Indian hero. And then they kill him like three issues later. So that's what set me on the road. You know, I said, I, you know, in my mind, I want I knew I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I, I wanted to make comic books and it would be all native heroes. And eventually I just got tired of waiting. Uh, Marvel would come out with heroes and, you know, they were always stereotypical. They were always hodgepodge. They were never, they never seemed to be like real natives. You know, they were like these, you know, the, the natives in the movies at that time. And they were, so, always uh, one six, they were always one sixteenth. Well, I never understood it. They could never yeah. be full bloods or half bloods. They were always one sixteenth of one thirty second. His his great great native grandmother farted on somebody and they became native. Yeah. yeah, no, like they were. And I think a big part of it was the lack of knowledge. They didn't know anything about Native Americans at that time, about contemporary natives. Everything that anyone knew was from the movies, you know, and the movies were were pretty jacked up, you know, so they always had us speaking in a weird way and that we didn't know English very well. And then came the stereotypes of, you know, oh, all Native American guys are violent drunk dudes and the women were quiet and didn't say anything. And, uh, you know, I just, I hit a point where I got tired. I was done, you know, so I started working on this team and uh, met up with a guy named Ryan Hunna Smith at a comic book store called Fantasy Comics out here. And I saw a piece of his art and, oh my God, I was blown away by this guy's art. And, you know, um, I had I'd created the group pretty much. And when we put it out, there was a lot of, you know, it was, we got weird reactions. And when we went to the San Diego Comic Con for the first time, uh, we weren't getting any traction and plus it, the lines were so long. We couldn't, we weren't going to be able to see all the publishers. And I was thinking, okay, how can I get to the, all the publishers that I need to get to? And I was standing by a booth and one of them, you know, kind of whispered in his, uh, friend's ear, man, you know, Hey, I got to go to the bathroom. And then the light bulb came off. I'm like, yeah, they all have to go to the bathroom at some point. <laughs> so, uh, I hung out. I hung out at the bathroom, and uh, I would see all the. You know, I recognized all the publishers, so I'd run up to them. I'd give them my ash can, and I'd say, "Hey, this is Tribal Force, first Native American superhero comic book," and blah blah blah, yada yada yada. And um, I would just hand it to them and run away, so they couldn't give it back to me. And eventually, I got contacted by one of those publishers that I hit up, but all the big boys stayed away from me. Uh, and you know, a couple of uh, a couple of them told me straight out, there's no way that they'll touch this with a 50 foot pole. And I was like, why? And they're like, cause it's native. And you know, the native discussion eventually goes back to why are they in the shape that they're in today? And when you do the forensics on that, it, all the fingers point back to the atrocity that the American government perpetrated on our people. There's just no two ways about it. So companies were shy, you know, they didn't want to get involved in that for whatever reasons. Uh, but luckily, uh, an independent publisher called Mystic Comics contacted me. Uh, they're the ones that did the first, you know, book and we put it out. Unfortunately, the company went out of business as we were working on issue two. So that was the only issue that came out. And then it, um, you know, it stayed in the minds of a lot of native, you know, people that picked it up. And eventually, years later, when the Smithsonian was doing something called Natives in Pop Culture, some of the artists that were bringing in pottery and beadwork and everything, they had images of tribal force on there. And the Smithsonian was like, well, who, who's this or what's this? And they would tell them, yeah, there's this comic book that came out in 1996 called Tribal Force. So they contacted us and uh, let us know that, you know, yeah, you are the first ever. And we want to put uh, Tribal Force into the Smithsonian Institute, uh, what they called Censure. 
Yeah, and it was I my mind was blown, man, because you know I'm a high school dropout, and um, there weren't a lot of great expectations for me. Uh, you know, being the guy that I was, you know, I was I was a bouncer. I worked at you know, as a bouncer, you know, in all the clubs out here in Tucson, and you know, um, I don't think anybody was thinking that, hey, yeah, this guy's going to create the first ever comic, native comic book and it's going to go in smithsonian but you know it was it was great that really stood out in my mind and for years tribal force haunted me i i tried to get it back up and running uh the original artist and i kind of parted ways and um through the years i would run into other artists that would help out uh, I, I couldn't pay them uh and then several publishing companies you know tried to do it but for whatever reason, <laughs> it never worked uh, until uh, one of the original colorists from Mystic Comics, uh, Gene Jimenez, him and I had been keeping in contact throughout the years. <coughs> he contacted me, or I contacted him, I think, I don't know. Uh, but we just started talking, and we were both in the right place at the right time. I had just finished Reservation Dogs Season 2. And I had a little bit of money and I was paying an artist to continue the, the book and I was slowly running out of money. So basically Gene and I uh, crafted a deal between Machine Comics and me and uh, now Machine Comics is publishing and you know, they did the Kickstarter and we're fully funded. We got fully funded. We got like, I think three or four days left. Uh, three days. So to, yeah. I three days. I have a countdown on my computer, actually. Be, <laughs> see, I'm an educator. I go around and I teach at schools. And I've done a couple of tribal schools. And what I tried to do is I, like I did last year, I bought uh, 300 copies of of the um, Native Voices, which they did a, oh, yeah. Marvel did a special Native Voice. I bought 300 copies to hand out free to kids that were in second and first, third grade. Oh, they need to see us like this. You know, I yeah. grew up like you with no, no, no role models. And, and, and that bothers me that we're only seen in three different levels, alcoholic and drunks in movies where we're ghost, you know, we're always on the, the, the haunted grounds or that we are um, in the West. We're in the background. We never see, I would love to see a native superhero. That's a lawyer by daytime. And a superhero by night, a, a successful native lawyer that went yeah. through the reservation, made something of, of himself. He became a tribal lawyer, a successful tribal lawyer, and he fights crime at nighttime. What a like, listen, not only can you be a superhero, kids, you can also be a friggin' lawyer. You don't have to yeah. settle. You can be this. You can be seen right. as a lawyer, as a doctor, as a judge, as whatever, and still be successful. And, and, and that's what I try to convey in my teachings to these students. Like, hey, yeah, we have the highest level of suicide. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. We, we no, I taught, yeah, I taught for years on the reservation. And now that I'm on reservation dogs, I got a lot of my students contacting me on Facebook and they're like, were you my teacher? And <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah I was. <laughs> Uh, but it was the same thing. I wanted to expose the kids to native heroes, you know, and I showed them tribal force and I showed them all the movies that I had done and to, you know, to motivate them to show them, Hey, you can do this. You know, I'm no different than you. I ate the same food you ate. I was a high school dropout. I got in trouble. You know, the police were at my cousin's house every weekend because he was super violent and drank a lot. And, you know, I, I grew up around the same thing. And it doesn't mean that that's going to be your future, that that is embedded in stone. You can change that. You can pursue the things you want to pursue, whatever they are, whether it's singing, dancing, you know, going to college and being an attorney and fighting crime at night. <laughs> yes. uh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, I got I was in the military and I used to take all my tribal comic books with me to Iraq. Oh, wow. So I took about 300 comic books. I snuck them in one of our, our cargo bays and took them with us because I, I was special forces in the military and we didn't have much to do when I was first stationed over there. So all my guys would come by my bunk and take comic books. They're like, 
dude, I never knew there was Native Heroes. I never even knew there was Native Heroes. I didn't ever do anything about this stuff. And they would just pass it around. And then, you know, I got named little, uh, you know, a, a, tr a tribal name. They're on, on base in Iraq. So what you're doing, I think, and I love the TV, but this, this comic book thing touches on a different level for me. Because I remember being dirt poor and my grandmother only being able to afford a 25 cent comic book from the grocery store. And me going, you know what? I have alcoholics in my family. I have drunks in my family. Where do I find my, my heroes? Well, the comic books. I got lost yeah. in fantasy. And a lot of us poor little native kids, we have to get lost in fantasy to find our, our, our heroes. So it's yeah. nice for people like you to go, they look like us too. Yeah, it was the same for me. My grandmother, when we go shop, we'd go shopping every two weeks. And I knew I, get, I could get comic books. I could get like, she would let me get four comic books, which was a dollar back then. They were 25 cents a piece. But, you know, the, the entertainment value of those things, of comic books, it just, because you could read them over and over again. And then I would clip uh, Spider-Man comic strips off of the weekend newspapers and uh, wherever I could find it. And then my cousins, uh, they had the TV guides. So they would give me the old TV guides and I'd cut out pictures of Blue Ferrigno as the Hulk or, you know, uh, any of those uh, superhero TV shows that came out at that time. I created a scrapbook. I was just so hungry for it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And see, the thing about it is, is like what he's talking about, encouraging more of our native youth to take up professional approaches in their life one of the things you know i, I was in tr uh, tribal law enforcement role for just over a year and a half it was not an easy thing for me to see so many of our kids going through the same native social justice issues on the res from gang violence to influences of you know drugs and alcohol and it's and it's usually the older natives that are leading our younger kids into this identity crisis yeah. And I have a problem with that. And then when I see tribal force and I see these beastie looking natives or, you know, beautiful femme fatales and, you know, characters that I can relate to, that's something that I want to see. I want it not, not that we should live in a fantasy world per se. I'm just saying the idea that we can get away from that daily grind mentality that seems to come with natives in the city and natives on the res. It's the same for all of us. But but the fact that you guys are putting that out there, and that's where the commendation for me comes from. That's It's really close to my heart. For the longest time when I was a kid, I even came up with my own comic book character. And if you want to take it, you go ahead and do that. It's a young boy that is dealing with, you know, domestic violence in his home. But the way he escapes is he goes out and gets on his BMX and he puts on headphones and all the classic 80s heavy metal and and hard rock and even funk music and everything else was available on the oh, radio. Yeah. Every time he puts his headphones on, he transforms into this superhero that he loves. It could be any number of superheroes. But when he jumps on his bike, his bike's got jets and he's just, whoa, you know, and he takes off and he's in his own <laughs> fantastic world. To me, that's, that's what I want to see. I want to encourage our kids to feel that. Not to say that I want to put a big stain with domestic violence out there, but I think we can all relate to that. Like you said, going shopping every two weeks or, if you opened up the oven door and turned it on to broil, if you, you know, because they shut your oil off or something in the middle of winter, you know, Indians can relate, bro. Be like, oh yeah, oh, yep, I've been there. <laughs> we could call it the wood stove now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's kind of funny. You said when I was thirteen years old, I created a comic book series. I couldn't draw worth a damn, but I was a great storyteller. I come from a family of storytellers. So I had created a comic book character that was, ho I'm holding the Shoney and we're smoke dancers. And uh, I grew up smoke dancing. I always thought, you know, how cool would it be if we had a Mohawk or Seneca guy that whenever he danced, smoke dance, he could create, he could control the weather. So uh, old oh, story, cool. of, the old story of the smoke dance is we could dance so hard that the smoke would rise and go out of the tubes of our longhouses. So imagine a smoke dancer having the power to dance so hard and when he started dancing, he could actually change the weather. Yeah. Yeah. No, and seeing those are the stories. We had superheroes thousands of years before everyone else. Yeah. We our heroes walked amongst us. Our gods walked amongst us. And they interacted with us. And it's always been a part of our culture. 
Uh, it's always been a part of our stories. And there's just so many, you know, that right now there's 753 registered tribes in the United States of America. And each one of those tribes has a language, has a culture. They have stories and heroes of their own. Uh, and it was always my hope that Tribal Force would motivate kids from other tribes to do their own book, to say, hey, this guy did it. I can do it. Um, you know, and I'm hoping, you know, as Tribal Force, more issues come out. I hope, you know, other Native kids do that. I mean, there's an ind indigenous Comic Con now, and I think they're on their third year. Third year. And yeah. I went to the first. Yeah, I went to the first two. So I got to meet all these young indigenous comic book creators and they came up and said, oh, my God, my dad bought me this book. Or when I was a little kid, I got Tribal Force. And it was so it meant so much to me that Tribal Force had a part, you know, in them becoming the new comic book creators. So there's yeah. some great stuff coming out. There's a book in Hawaii called Pineapple Man. Amazing. It's by a guy named Sam Campos. And he came out about the same time Tribal Force. We came out at the same time, roughly. And just awesome, man. You know, see Hawaiian-style heroes from Hawaiians. Okay. And, you know, yeah. And, you know, there's the hero twins, Shadow Wolf, uh, you know, Akagi from Canada. All these new books that are coming out from, you know, Native creators. And it's just, yeah. it's so cool to see. And less than... Uh, well, we've been sitting here. I've gotten text messages going, where can I get the comic? Where can I get the comic? Where does he sell the comic? Where can I get the I, I, got, I got 33 messages on my phone right now. I'm like, hey, he has not told us where we get the comic. Where can we get this comic from? Uh, we're on Kickstarter right now. So if you go to Machine Comics or you go to my Facebook page, uh, there'll be a link there to our Kickstarter. Uh, we got three days left, so you still got time. Because I want all the, I do want, I want every cover. I would like to make a collage for my house, like my how I have Red Wolf. I want every cover you have for the Tribal Force and put in a collage. And of course, your signature on one of them, at least. So yeah, I got, I have all the Red Wolf comic books that came out. I have his first appearance. Um, I collected all the Red Wolves from the 70s. I just finished I have, the collection about two months ago. I have them all because I went on Comic Book Men. They brought me on Comic Book, and I was able to get them. Yeah, I was able to Shut go on. Up. Yeah, my that wife got me in. Cool. So my wife got me an audition on uh, Comic Book Men. She made me do a video on YouTube, which my <laughs> my audition my audition tape is still on YouTube. So I was able to go on Comic Book Men, and they had never brought a native person onto the show. So they brought me on, no, and I, I was able to get. I got all the comics of Red Wolf. They had they had to research how to get them because he wasn't wow. he only had seven issues. So yeah. I got them, and then I got the I got all the new ones. I got all the new Red Wolf when they tried to they relaunched okay. them. I think two yeah. the, about five years ago they relaunched them. You know. Yeah, I've been trying to talk to Marvel. I really would like to do a John Proud story story. story. Um, I, I wasn't very happy with the new incarnation of him uh, as far as the costume went. I contacted one of the creators and I was pleading with him. I'm like, please, <laughs> I'm well, like, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't dig the costume that you're putting on Proud Star. <laughs> yeah, well, and, I, don't, uh, I don't like the fact that they changed his backstory because they changed him to uh, Warpaint. He's no longer, he's John Proud Star, used to be Thunderbird. Yeah, and then they they migrated him to War Paint now. Now he's War Paint. He's no longer Thunderbird. He's War Paint, which is some people say is supposed to be a multiverse, uh, a multiverse character of John Proudstar is War Paint. But it's kind of weird because if you the latest issue I I read, they actually called him uh, John Proudstar. Well, my question yeah. is: is that, Does he correlate with the War Paint singers, though? You know what I mean? Does he pick that? <laughs> Some superhero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the world. Hey, no. Okay, so, I have. To, I'm sorry. Go ahead. People. There's a lot of famous native people out there. A lot of people don't know. I always brag up the fact that we're we're like really closely related to the La Fountains. There was a man in Hollywood for the longest time, is uh, Chippewa Cree, 
Uh, his name was Don LaFontaine was his Hollywood name, but it's, it's La Fountain uh, on the Rocky Boy Res, Turtle Mountain as well. They're, they're La Fountains are Rocky Boys and Turtle Mountain, as well as Bell Guards and the Peltiers as well. But you probably remember him from Coming Soon to DVD and Blu-ray. If you heard that voice, Patrick's got to go. He'll be right back. But that was what, yeah, that was, a, that's a native man doing that voice. And that, that's what really made me excited is to think, you know, we are spanning out. Now I'm looking at it like this from a 21st century view. When we're seeing people, like you said, you're a bouncer. That to me would be a badass backstory. This guy is a bouncer uh-huh. during the daytime. He kind of keeps everything, you know, from getting too rowdy at the bar. You know what I mean? He's a native. He's like six, five, but. You know, everybody just knows him as a you know really knock around guy. He's a regular, you know what I'm saying? But they don't know a superhero persona. You know, to I always talk about Hancock to people when we talk about superheroes because Hancock, first of all, they're not expecting him to be a he's he's not an they don't know him as an eternal. But then when they when you find out the story in the movie, Hancock is an eternal god that was created with a partner who had the same powers, but as soon as they get close to each other. That's their kryptonite is them being together. And the further they are away from each other, then his powers come back, her powers come back. Yeah. I like that idea. And I also like the fact that they made him somebody who was sitting there drunk on a bench, passed out in the hot L.A. sun. And then some kid comes up and knocks him around. Hey, do you think you might want to get up and help out? You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that, that's just, just for that story. I think it was a really good thing because now all of a sudden he's got a mission. And then that really yeah. helped Justin Bateman's character to clean up. Hey, bro, you know, people are rooting for you, but pardon the expression, but you're an asshole, you know, and that makes him upset. And and, and, and when you think about that, you're, you're listening to the story of Hancock and you see him, he's drunk, he's got, you know, facial hair growing in, he just don't care about anything. He passes out wherever and smashes everything up. But finally, when he cleans up his act, he gets it together. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> This issue pissed me off. What is it? Because it's an issue of Red oh, Wolf, Red but Wolf, they made the yeah. cover. They made it look like there was a damn uh, action figure. I looked for this action figure for three months and realized <laughs> they never made the action figure. It was just the cover. So they made the cover yeah. look just like it was a box action figure, which made me so angry. How badass of an action figure would that have done if they had actually made a real action figure? And don't yeah. get me wrong, but they should have put some fringe on his vest and not made him look so much <laughs> like Indiana Jones in that. Outfit. You know what? I, I'm, I'm, li- I'm happy they didn't do too much with them. I'm so right. sick of the stereotype. Make us look normal. We don't wear fringe all the time. No, we don't wear yeah. other all the time. It's just to a point where it's like it's too much. And, yeah. and that's what white people that's the issue with white people now because they think we're supposed to look that way. They don't realize we wear shirts and ties and 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 business attire and stuff like that. So seeing this, it kind of made him feel like he you could see him walking down the real streets. Like he looks yeah. like a real guy that he doesn't look too like he's not gonna pick up grass and smell it and drop one tear. <laughs> Yeah, no, when I designed Tribal Force, that was one of the things I wanted to make sure the characters didn't have fringe or feathers. Uh, You know, the only one that kind of does have feathers is Jaguar Knight because he's Aztec and they use the Quetzal feathers uh, in their battle in their battle regalia. But the younger ones, the younger heroes like Little Bighorn, the guy with the big, you know, the four arms and the buffalo horns. Uh, he's a young guy, so he hasn't earned his feathers yet. And at some that. point, you know, he'll he'll earn his feathers and we'll show everyone how those feathers come about and how they're earned uh, and different things like that. There's things that aren't on their costumes yet because they haven't earned them. And, right. you know, writing that part of their culture is really important to me uh, because, you know, uh, our lead character, Nita, she is uh, half Yoeme, Yaki, and half Dene. Navajo and there's she, she, and you can't see anything on her that looks native except me <laughs> she put some more paint on her face like Willie Jack but yeah. uh you know she wears a jersey and these uh real tight you know skin tight uh skater uh tights and she's into she's got a hoverboard and she loves her hoverboard 
Uh, but eventually, as she learns more about her power and her culture, she'll incorporate those things into her costume, uh, which I think is a... Say again? Does she wear any turquoise or coral at all? The in part the net, not, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, not right now. Not right now she doesn't. But <laughs> but I, uh, who knows, I, eventually. I love how you add the fact of earning stuff. I talked about this on the show before. I'm a traditionalist. And I think our traditions have changed so much that we've lost what it means to have eagle feathers. Eagle feathers do not mean what they used to mean anymore because we're giving them to our eight-year-olds. We're giving our eight-year-olds full eagle bustles, full war bonnets to dance with, and they no longer have they don't no longer have pride for it because it's so easy. Our, our dads want their sons to look just like them. When I was a kid growing up, you had to earn those feathers yeah. you weren't allowed to you weren't, just couldn't just dance in feathers i didn't get my first eagle feather until i was like 16 years old and that was me volunteering at sweat lodge every single night for all summertime for the elders i had to volunteer at sweat lodge to be the fire keeper or whatever else they needed for an entire summer for me to get my first roach feathers so yeah i mean I didn't get my first eagle feather till my, I think I was in my early thirties and I didn't even want it. Uh, the person who was trying to give it to me, I kept saying no. And you know, she was like, why, why don't you want it? And I go, cause I don't think I deserve one. I don't think, I don't think I'm a good enough person to, uh, to hold that, you know? And the, the way she convinced me, she goes, well, that's good. That's good that you know that you're flawed. That's good that you know that you have a ways to go. And she goes, and this will always remind you of the person that you should be. So I accepted it because I thought, okay, that's good. Maybe I need something that will remind me uh, not to be this flawed human being that I am and try and be better. So I've been trying to live up to it ever since. Right. Now, do you talk about ceremony or anything like that in any of your comic series that you've done? Uh, yeah, we will. We will. It's It's difficult because... The story is them they're they get together real fast and they're being hunted. So there's not a lot of downtime to do those stories quite yet. But we will slowly be injecting those in there little by little because uh it's a story about gods and uh you know the, the that's how the book starts out. It's a quote from uh, Nita's journal, and she's like, This isn't a story about heroes, it's a story about gods. And the research that I've done on gods, they're not very nice. <laughs> no. And that goes they're through, not. That's all cultures. Yeah. You notice that's all cultures. That's all. If you look at the Greek pantheon, horrible people. Greek, yeah. Greek, yeah. Greek, Greek gods were horrendous. Yeah, yeah they're, like, they're, they're lightning and flood them out and send the crack yeah. after them. <laughs> they just have a different mindset when it comes to humans, and that's that's what tribal force is about. You know, you're going to get a, a look into the, how these gods are made and these kids that now have the powers of these gods and they slowly start to transform into gods. And there may be things people don't like, you know, cause they're not heroic in, in, in the, in that sense, they're gods and they have, they have a job to do and they're going to do it regardless. And it may not be popular to humans, on how they get those jobs done, but that's their job. That's the word of creator, and that, that's who they're following. They're not necessarily here to coddle and cajole human beings. Yeah. And these are lessons that you know these kids are learning. I mean, they're gods, but they, in their mind, they're still young kids. You know, Nita doesn't quite understand godhood. She slowly get. You know, I don't want to give too much. <laughs> no, no, no. That's absolutely right. You don't want to sell it out, but. Yeah. Is the first issue is the first issue still available? Uh, no, it, the first issue is coming out now. It's it's got the first issue I put out a while back. It, it wasn't the way I wanted it to be. So this new one's got like fourteen new pages of art and story, and it's finally being told the way I wanted to tell it. Uh, some of my characters take on social issues. Like I worked with survivors of child molestation for thirty years. 34 years and violent youth offenders. So Nita is a survivor of child molestation and little Bighorn or Gabriel, Gabriel medicine dog, who is a hunk Papa Sue 
he is a violent youth offender and he can't speak. He had fetal alcohol effect when he was a baby. So his vocal cords never developed quite well. So he has to use sign language to communicate. Uh, and he's a super violent guy. He's just a super violent young native kid that we all know. We all know that native kid that's been, you know, put in foster care and has gone from juvie and he's sure enough going to go to prison. That's yeah. Gabe. That's yeah. Yeah. That's little Bighorn. And, uh, you know, so this is the material that Thunder Eagle, the God is how ha that has to work with are these little violent characters, <laughs> the worst people you would want with this power, you know? <laughs> well, and then, but on the flip side of that, there becomes a, there, there's that line of responsibility as like I was, we were talking about Hancock a minute ago, you might start in a certain place, but that does not necessarily, you know, guide you into where you're finishing because you're yeah. conscious. Your, your spirit, that's the part about having that elder character, that wise elder. Like, oh, we thought about what it would be to, and when you add characters in these types of roles in a comic book series, for instance. I always thought about the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. Each of those has its own power. But if you put that, that element with the role of an elder, you could design the most beautiful looking elder characters that have the power of the air, that have the power of the water, the fire, and the earth to guide them and give them something to work for. Now, yeah, he's violent. He grew up in a home where domestic violence was a daily occurrence. Of course he's going to take that. And then, you know, went, went partying one night and, you know, wanted to show how tough of a tough guy he was and ended up pulling out a knife or a gun and, and that was it. And I've seen that happen in real life. So the idea yeah. that we can encourage our kids away from some stuff like that, you know, that's why I'm saying I'm really proud to see you doing this. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, and it's it's the original concept of the warrior. Uh, for forever, people thought warrior meant to be violent and to kill and all this stuff. And yes, that's a component of it. And you know, and you being in the special forces, I'm sure when you jump out of a plane, what do you hear? Geronimo. Geronimo. You know, yep. straight. Our greatest yep. warriors, but but being a warrior in the native culture had nothing to do with killing or fighting. It was about taking care of the people, taking care of the youth, taking care of the elders, making sure everyone had something to eat. Uh, that was being a warrior. It wasn't until the Europeans came over and saw how fierce we were because not only were we protecting our families, but we were protecting land. And not because we owned it, but because of a promise that we had made to our God. And that's why we were fighting so hard, not for the ownership of land, but for the promise that we made to Creator and they saw that as my God, these guys are crazy. They're insane. They're, they're incredible warriors because they fight to the last man and they, one native guy will take out five regular, you know, uh, soldiers. So that, that was put on us. And even today, our youth think that, oh, in order to be a warrior, I got to be tough. I got to be mean. I got to be uh, brutal. Yes. In certain times. Yes, you do. But that's not what it means to be a warrior. What it means to be a warrior is to take care of your people, to take care of your village, make sure everyone that doesn't have food has food. Uh, you know, once our youth learn that um, new definition of warrior, I think it's going to have a profound effect on them. Have you noticed the, the direction? I'm sorry to cut you off, Ron. That's go ahead. Okay. No. no, you go right ahead. I'll finish up. I can't. Um, I'm loving the direction. We are getting some kind of knowledge out in Hollywood right now with the What If series are about to appear. The, a very original Aquasasia Mohawk character uh, in the What If series, the Marvel What If series, which is coming on TV, as well as the new Avatar, the Avatar movie that is coming out. We have six native people that will be represented in the Avatar movie, which I'm a big Avatar fan. And it always was weird that Sokka and his and his sister were supposed to be native. They were supposed to be native people of native tribes because they represented the the uh, the water. So yeah, in in the new series, they have two Akasasi Mohawks playing Sokka and Katara uh, in the new um in the new uh, Avatar series, which I'm yeah. super super excited about. And we have the new Echo series as well. The Marvel yeah. Echo series are coming out. Uh, and um, um, Blue Beetle. Blue <laughs> Beetle is another one. So yeah. it is, we are starting to, to, to dig our way into this medium. Uh, 
Uh, Because I wanted to touch on what we talked about right before we came on here was uh, you said you turned down some roles because you got tired of the stereotypic roles. Because that's I have preached about that a million times on here. You know, where's our where's our sitcoms at that we have where where we have a successful native in a business suit having the same problems every day person, but you mix in native issues. So because yeah. that's how because we walk in two worlds now we're we're not for, we we no longer can walk in just the traditional world anymore for us to survive we have to walk in two worlds we have to walk into white man's world as well as the native world so it'd be nice to have a concept of a a successful native lawyer that has to deal with tribal society and 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 the things that are covered up with the missing indigenous women and and then the non investigations. But it'd be nice to see a successful, not just a drunk. I'm so sick of seeing the drunks. I'm so sick of seeing the depressive ass shows. Every Native people shouldn't just look at TV shows and say, man, I feel worse. I feel worse because yeah. all I see is homeless, drug addicts, and alcoholics, people struggling with all this stuff. When are we going to see a success? I mean, well, the only successful was... movies are led by white, only ones that are led by native stories. We have the only successful native stories have white heroes. Yeah. Such as, uh, you know, Crooked Arrows. Crooked Arrows was a great movie, native movie. What did they have to do? They throw a white man in there to be the hero, uh, the white coat, cross coach to be the white hero. Like Superman, Patrick, okay. <laughs> what, what was Superman? I'm being honest. The movie was fantastic, but then they put Brandon Roth. As a half breed native that went back to the res to save <laughs> to save a game that our people invented. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, thank so, God for those white guys who save our culture. <laughs> yeah, you know? Right. He was playing yeah. Native American man. And, uh, the the new that? show about the new show about missing indigenous women with Hillary the the new mi- show with the, about missing indigenous women. Could they just make it indigenous women? Of course not. They had to put that one white woman that's the lead investigator to lead everything. You know what I mean? We're always saved. And that's what bothers yeah. me. It drives me absolutely insane. They call that Sorry. Well, and that's, that's a big thing that attracted me to Reservation Dogs. Um, originally, I was cast to play Big, the character Big. Um, but unfortunately, right before we were going to shoot the pilot, I got diagnosed with COVID. So they had to recast the role. And I, I love what Zahn did with it. Uh, Zahn's such a great actor. And yeah. uh, uh, Taika and Sterling, you know, they had called me to let me know that, you know, they had to replace me, unfortunately. But they said, if we get picked up for series, we're going to come back for you. And I was like, oh, my God. I thought it was I thought I was done. You know, I thought, yeah, they're not going to come back. for me. Uh but luckily, they kept their word, and Sterling wrote this great character of Leon for me. And when I read it, it was so cool because, you know, I'm like, okay, where's the alcohol coming in? Where's the the typical stuff? And never happened. He was just this great dad, had a great relationship with his daughter. Uh, you know, they had a really nice house and a truck and hunting gear. And nor it was normal. It was just a normal father daughter and i was like oh my god i couldn't believe how cool that was and that we were going to do that and then when we did that episode it was so neat it was so cool because the response that we got from it that we got from fans saying oh you remind me of my dad or my uncle um you know who used to take me hunting and it, it touched a nerve in the native community and it was so cool. They love seeing this father-daughter thing happening between Willie Jack and I. And I never realized, yeah, I never realized how similar Willie Jack and I really are. <laughs> like, uh, there's, I look at us sometimes, I'm like, yeah, we do look like father and daughter. Um, but, you know, and she did such a great job and she's such a tough character. But then when she's around me, you see this softer side of her, which is awesome. And he's a good dad. You know, he's just, he's a good dad. He's there. Is he perfect? No, not at all. And our native fathers need to know that, that you know, you're not here to be perfect. You're just here to be here. And Whoa. we'll take whatever you got. Yeah. <sighs> that's, we're, that's, we're, 
we're both fathers of daughters. So like that's to me, that, yes, absolutely. A light smattering of applause. See, but what I was talking about earlier is that we're coming into the age of information, according to the, the Gregorian calendar. But in, in our prophecies, we're coming into the age of enlightenment for all people of the earth. And what's going on is that this transition away from all of these toxic ways of living, from the decimation yeah. of, of Mother Earth in every way you can imagine, the corporations fighting tooth and nail to to destroy the land, to destroy the air, the water, and the earth, and everything that they can get their ugly, greedy hands on, this is what our people are all of a sudden are seeing these leadership roles. Sterling Harjo coming into a place as a writer in a mainstream media outfit to say, you know what, we've got a story to tell that's going to be inspirational. For instance, when they, when they brought up Deer Woman, I was like, oh, hell yeah, they're talking about Deer Woman now? Oh, son, we, hey, all the women, hey, you don't, shh, don't be talking about her at night like that. I'm like, oh, you're right. Hey, but the show's on at night, babe. Hey, no. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying is, is that when we get this leadership aspect, now it's starting to permeate here, yeah. here and here with tribal force. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to prophesize. I'm just going to almost guarantee that here in the next few years, it's going to be something that it'll be household because not just native kids want to read good comic books that, that are, that are tribally themed. All kids want to, I got kids yeah. in the black community, the white community, the Mexican community. They're like, Hey man, you guys got that cool comic book tribal force. Huh? I'm like, yeah, you guys like that. And like, could you give me some episodes? You know, don't, don't ask for, don't, you know what I'm saying? That's what I, yeah. I look forward to this. Your presence on 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 uh, hit TV series, your presence out there doing things like that. That's what we want. We want more inspiration. And if you get the opportunity to have Sterling come on and kick it with us on on the BNB Indigenous podcast one of these times, we I, won't be mad, John. <laughs> that guy is so hard to get a hold of. He rarely returns my texts now. <laughs> really? like, he's a, a little big little star. Back and stuck up. <laughs> yeah and every now and then i can get taika to respond it's not all the time yeah. but every so often he'll return a text or something and i'm like oh my god taika returned the text <laughs> well i got to i got to speak to sterling earlier this year uh well a little bit i don't even know if it's really sterling it might be his assistant but um i've been writing a i've been writing a treatment i've been writing two treatments uh a native um uh, something me and my wife are working on she was the actress but like i said i'm a storyteller so i wrote a treatment for a native sitcom uh and then i wrote a treatment about a native uh, on a native movie and i just sent it to him i was like you know what just tell me how bad it is where i could fix it and i just sent it to him and he wrote me back which was pretty amazing i didn't think i was going to hear nothing back from wow. he told me he goes please tell this story patrick this is a story that's never been told before please tell this story and it was a it was a, a movie idea for a native soldier like myself it's my story but uh with a little bit of additive so i told my story as being a native person joining the military being a res kid joining the military so i give a perspective on what it's like coming back because I deal with PTSD, I deal with depression, I deal with all this stuff and I just sent it to him just just to see him he was like, dude, you gotta tell this story I love it uh, I think all you gotta do is get somebody to write it for you I think you're right on where you need to be and I was like, I'm not gonna lie, I was like a, a girl at a Justin Bieber concert I was like you know what what are those, you know because it's Sterling, it's Sterling. You know, I watched yeah. the movies. He's a big, he, he's a big superstar. And as a native man, as an educator, as as a guy that continues to try to to encourage our people to continue to strive for better things than what has been given to you, to hear that from somebody like that. Because my wife is the only one that really seen that in me, and she encouraged this story for me to write. And wow. she's passed on. She's crossed over. And. To hear that from Sterling kind of got my juices to writing again and starting to tell my stories again. So absolutely, Sterling is like, you know, in a Native community, especially for me, I'm like a big hero in a lot of ways. Yeah, Sterling. What was that? So do you see us doing a movie? Because I'd really love to be your sound your sound guy for that. Like, 
rock and roll look at that you already got your sound crew man <laughs> yeah, listen to me when i say this there's a lot of native professionals in all aspects you know i mean you obviously sterling's not just one person out there i mean there are writers there are people that have you know a martinez he's a well-known person in the in not only in native movies but in the soap opera world for the longest time he's like yeah. days of our lives you know graham green is one of those that you could talk about you know other people gary farmer as a matter of fact his guitarist brock stonefish was on our show a couple weeks back there's a lot of people out there in the native community that would make something so amazing and tribal force. Like, come on, bro. Like a, a movie like that. I always talk about <laughs> openers. Marvel. You'll see the comic book flipping through all of the yeah. pages. And then it'll, it's just all these. Pictures. <laughs> I think about something like that that will really light it up for the kids. That's what I want to see. If there was a movie yeah. that I kids that kids remember when they're in their thirties, man, I love that movie, man. Yeah, and if we can yeah. get those characters on there to be like, dude, that was like my, my favorite character ever. That's what I want to see. I mean, yeah, you've got a comic book, and it's starting to really see some success. It's been around since what you said, nineteen eighty nine, and now you're starting 86, to see or ninety six. Ninety six. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not battle. Oh, good lord. <laughs> But still, if it was, you know what I mean? Still, I mean, it's still, to me, it's it's now become a mainstay of its own in our Native community, but I would love to see it expand. And I know there's opportunities yeah. for that. Well, we're working on it. You know, we've we've had some inquiries. Uh, it's just really hard to navigate in the Hollywood system. And, you know, the whole thing is about control. And when big money comes in, it's hard to maintain that control because big money wants the control. They're not going to, and especially not just because you're native, because you're a first timer. When you're a first timer and you're going in there, you kind of have your hat in your hand. You can't go in there saying, well, I want this, I want this, and you better do this. And you, you, you start doing that. They're going to be like, okay, we'll just find, we'll just make our own tribal force. We'll just find somebody who will copy what you did and change it enough to where we can call it our own. Yeah. And not have to deal with your culture, not have to deal with this or that. So it's it's difficult. Trust me, I was approached early on in 96 uh, by an animation studio. And I was dirt poor, man. I had nothing. And they were throwing big figures out at me. But they wouldn't give me the creative control that I wanted. And I had to walk away from it. And man alive, I I heard it from my family. I heard it from friends. You know, you're a loser. You should have taken that money. You're a single father. You could have left that money for your daughter. And, you know, I was working at car washes and, you know, again, bouncing at nightclubs. And they were like, why did you turn all that money down? And I said, listen, if Tribal Force comes out and they do it the way they want to do it, it'll be forgotten. It'll just be a, a red X-Men, you know, red colored X-Men, and then it'll die. If I can do it the way I want to do it, it'll last forever. And, you know, a lot of people didn't understand that. And, and like when we were talking about earlier, turning down movie roles, uh, I had to have a long talk with my agent because I think in the beginning she thought I thought I was some big movie star. <laughs> and I said, no, I know exactly who I am. I'm not thinking I'm too big for these movies or anything like that. I get it. I'm an unknown native actor here in Tucson, Arizona, and I shouldn't be turning movies down. I get it. But I don't want to perpetrate the stereotype. I've done that. I did that in a movie called Skinwalkers where I played a violent drunk guy, and I didn't like the way I felt afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you, you know. You, mean you have morals? What are those? You have morals. Standies. I'm not. Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, they do exist. Morals do exist. And I mean, for me, as a traditional dad, you're the kind of guy we need more of. Because well, the money you. is so easy to take. The money is so yeah. easy to take. No Especially when you're hungry, yeah. bro. This is the thing about it, man. Like, uh, you can talk about superheroes all day, but there's also another part of that. Whether it's DC or Marvel or Tribal Force or whoever, I've you know I used to read a lot of heavy metal comics growing up, and a lot of their characters are darker in nature. I was even yeah. thinking about a a residential school survivor that became the bad guy like he was like all right and and took down some major institutions without actually saying their name like that that to me is somebody i i think about like 
because I do have those tendencies where I think about how much sinister stuff has been done against us as a people. Yeah. Whether I mean, there are 574 federally recognized tribes and about 1,500 that aren't recognized or just were completely yeah. wiped out. Yeah, there is some need for some payback institution out there. I'm not. I'm not trying to put that all out there in the form of negativity. I'm just saying, could you could you blame him? Could do you blame Magneto for the way he turned out? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, no, exactly, exactly. And it's not. Unfortunately, that's the thing with the native culture that scares a lot of people off is because when you do the forensics on the history, the finger points back to them. The finger points back to their culture, finger points back to their churches, their governments. And how do you rectify that? How do you make that better? How do you, you know, take responsibility for that? Uh, You know, because they preach it a lot with other countries. You know, they were all over Iraq when Saddam Hussein gassed 11,000 Kurds. And we looked at him and we shook an angry finger at him and said, hey, you better cut that out. But then he starts burning oil fields in Providence 17, and we overnight, we FedEx the Seventh Fleet to the Persian Gulf (laughs) because he's burning oil. We didn't care about the Kurds. We didn't give a crap about 11,000 Kurds that he he, he used mustard gas against these people, and we did nothing. We did nothing. But you burn our oil— my brother right there in the red shirt got sent over there. <laughs> Three times. And I, and I really say that, like I said, because he was an installation of the U.S. imperialism manifesto. Yeah. No, we created him. We created him. We created Gaddafi. We, we created uh, bin Laden. You know, uh, we, 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 we financed the Mujahideen. You know. We, we, we friggin' trained the Taliban. Yeah. And people don't realize that. Uh, our first tour in in the Middle East, that our CIA agents are the ones that trained the Taliban to fight against Russia. We trained the Taliban to because the Russian was going to come in come in there. So we went in and trained the Taliban. Because remember, here's a good example. Remember Rambo? They yeah. had a whole Rambo oh, movie yeah. about that. How the Middle Eastern people was our friends, and they were <laughs> training them to protect themselves against the Russian invaders. We trained the Taliban and we made a promise. Like, I don't talk about a lot of my, my, much of my military stuff, but we trained them to keep away Russians and we promised them after they pushed the Russians out that, that we would leave. Yeah. Well, the US don't have a habit of leaving. So we stayed there <laughs> and that's what happened with the whole insurgency. They got mad because we didn't leave and that's when they became enemies. Yeah. Well, Yeah, that's what we're dealing with with the Native American situation when it comes to Hollywood and everything I've encountered is nobody wants to accept responsibility or hear about it. They don't want to hear the true story because the true story is too hard to uh, swallow. Uh, You know, and I, I give speeches everywhere and I talk to people and I say, is there a reservation in your community? And of course, people raise their hands and I'm like, how many of you have been there? course nobody raises their hands i said in nazi germany when all that stuff was going on it was the same thing the people had heard about the internment caps that were eight ten miles down the road but they had never been there and when we you know when we liberated the prison camps and went into the german towns they were all shrugging their shoulders like we didn't know that was going on and then they made them the, the american generals made them go to the prison camps and bury the dead Jewish people and see the atrocities that were being done. And these people were vomiting and throwing up and, you know, probably had nightmares for the rest of their lives. But it's the same thing here. You know, people are shrugging their shoulders like, well, I heard it's pretty shitty on the reservations, but I've never been there. I don't know what's really going on because, you know, when you don't, you know, out of sight, out of mind, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to sit there at home feeling guilty that there's a community living in third world conditions, that there's a community that has the highest suicide rate in this country, that seven out of 10 Native American women will experience some form of violence or molestation in their lifetime. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's not in your living room. It's not in your school system. So don't worry about it. But the jerk say amen. 
Let the, let, <laughs> let, the, let the church say amen. We we talk about this. We talk about these subjects on this show regularly. We're talking about how and native people. We have a lot to blame. We are a lot to blame because we keep a lot of shit secret. And we don't yeah. speak up. We don't we talk about the amount of child molestation that goes on the reservations. I brought this up not too long ago. We need to start calling these people out. We have this whole Nathan, this Nathan chasing horse thing going on right now. And people are going, oh, well, well, we didn't know. Yeah, you did. 2000, 2016, we, I brought it up. I put it on there because two women came out against him. Everybody's like, well, he's a movie star and we should look past him. You know, he's done good for the movies. And now look at this guy. Now people are like, well, boy, this is a bad guy. No, we could have fixed this problem a long time ago, except we don't like call native communities. Don't like calls and waves. So we just like, yeah. oh, oh, just stay away from that uncle. He likes to touch. So just stay away from him. Just <laughs> stay away from it. You know what I mean? How many of us in the family members go? We had that one family member that, you know, don't go near that guy. We don't leave our kids alone with him. He's just, he's yeah. that crazy uncle. If you're a real yeah, that's me. Oh, hello. Oh, there you are. I was like, wait a minute. Where did he go? <laughs> I was saying, if you're a reader like me, Mein Kampf is a book that Hitler wrote when he was in prison before they let him out and started lifting him into the position that he finally became as the Fuhrer, right? He got his ideas for the internment and the subsequent genocide that was committed against six million Jews from what he read about the United States Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of War before it was transitioned into the Department of the Interior from what they did to us. I mean, internment camp, well, reservation, prison camp, whatever you want to call it. Hey, Kyle. He actually he actually sent uh, agents down to America, and they purchased the reservation plans from America. So the way that the government offices are set up in the Rosebud Reservation are exact replicas of Auschwitz and Dachau. Yeah. Um, but he and took I've, it to the I've next been level. To I've never been to any of them, but I really do want to go. Yeah. I was uh, stationed in Germany. Yeah, he was so impressed with how they handled the Native Americans. Because Thomas Jefferson and his administration had basically planned the way they were going to deal with Natives was basically up in the Rosebud Reservation. Sorry I got to back. No, uh, he, the Amer Native Americans were supposed to be exterminated by 1926. There was... They had scheduled that only 800 natives would be left by that time period if they would have done, if they would have followed through with their plans, but they didn't. They failed. They failed to kill us. So we're still here. Uh, so Thomas Jefferson failed miserably. He couldn't even kill us. Loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right in your face, Thomas. George, <laughs> Mr. Washington, a Abraham Lincoln. They you know, really just getting all up in their face like that. What's up, Lincoln? <laughs> John, we have like a ton more questions, but I know it's eight. It's, it's been an hour, and uh, and 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 can you stay on a little bit longer, or do you yeah, need to get yeah. off up here? All right, great. No, I'm, fine. I'm enjoying this too much. I don't want you to go nowhere. Um, yeah. You know, but this is the type of conversations we need to have. We don't have these conversations, and we don't have them in our living rooms. We talk about them, but nothing is fixed from it. A lot of the things that you know. I talk about in uh, like for for instance, I talk about spending money within our communities. Before yeah. you buy anything, you should investigate to see if there's a native business out there that does that thing. That's if right. there's a native business that does that thing, how about you start investing your money within the native people? How are you going to sit here and tell me you can't afford uh, a two hundred fifty dollar pair a piece of beadwork, but you can afford five hundred dollars worth of Nikes? <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know uh so don't uh, it's it's i i kind of admire the amish the way the amish run their communities in a lot of ways they believe in spending their money within the community they spend their money within the community everyone's taken care of so you spend for the goods that your community makes first instead of like yeah. having to worry about the uh, you know we're so so quick to run to wally world was they say wally world is the next growing reservation uh, yeah. <laughs> when, when we when we have natives that make so we have so many native businesses out there that don't get enough love. You yeah. know, I I like your comic book. 
our our podcast is going to make a dedication to spread information about your comic book. We want uh, more people to know about it. And I want a copy. Um, yeah. I'm going to spread the love. I don't care what anybody says. You can Absolutely. Saying, and I want the whole goddamn series. I want the whole goddamn <laughs> series, yes. Well, the black community, the African-American community, realized what they were doing to themselves in the 1970s. They were, they were where we're at right now. Nobody, none of the black community was supporting black films or black businesses or anything like that. It was that crab syndrome that no other black person wanted to see another black person succeed. That's it wasn't right. until they changed their mentality where they said, when something black comes out, we're going to support the holy crap out of it. And that's what we need to do, what the, the African-American community did. They smartened up. And now look yep. at them. You have, you have two black billionaire entrepreneurs that are looking to buy, I think, buy NBC or buy, I forgot what they were going to buy. They're kind of, yep. they're in a bidding war. Tyler Perry and uh, uh, who's the other guy? Uh, Brian Allen. Um, Tyler Perry just billion. spent, yeah, yeah, Tyler Perry just spent, what, uh, $10.6 billion on that studio where he can make his own damn films. That's right. And That's his, right. His, studio is massive and he employs like two thirds of african-american actors and actresses in the industry yeah Just tyler perry actors. lebron james oprah winfrey yeah. uh yeah. wilt chamberlain um uh you know all these guys are investing back in their community and that's where the change really comes is when that investment happens from our own people and we're not quite there yet the indian gaming community is doing that they're finally getting other tribes to help other tribes that aren't doing fiscally as well and they're also teaching tribes to diversify outside of casino money so that if the casino bubble ever busts they'll have something to fall back on uh so that's great that you know we're not trying to be competitive with other tribes we cannot no tribe can be successful if their brothers and sisters and cousin tribes are suffering that would be totally against the way we live to, to walk around, you know, a multimillionaire and your cousins and sisters are, are languishing in hunger or drug addiction. And I'm not, you know, I get it. This is America. It's good to be rich. It's good to get money. I'm not advocating against that. I'm just saying, don't forget, don't forget where you came from. Invest in your community, put something back in. You know, well, and, and, well, and we're all doing it. Well, this. you're a good you're a good example. I reached out to I've over the last our podcast. I know it's small. We are getting bigger. Our podcast is growing. We're getting carried on TV now. We're getting carried on other reservations. But I've reached out to quite a bit of actors to try to get them on the show. I've reached out to West Studi, uh, no response back. I reached out to Adam Beach, no response back. And Adam Beach's secretary reached out to me and said, well, how many viewers do you have? I said, we're very small. We're growing. Oh, well, we don't really like doing uh, these things unless they have a following of at least 17,000. <laughs> and I'm like, 17,000? Uh, uh, we're nowhere near 17,000. I mean, we're lucky to get two, 3,000 for each show, but we're growing every, every week. We get another 1,000 viewers every week so it's growing it's not where i want it to be yet but people like you we are small indigenous company trying to get our word out there trying to because we do handle some dark stuff because yeah. we talk about things nobody else wants to talk about we talk about the child molestation we talk about the missing indigenous women we talk about you know the spousal abuse epidemic that goes on we talk about our actors and actresses that are taking roles for money and not for, you know, I was upset that Adam Beach took that Marvel role that he was died in three and a half seconds. Yeah. He took a, no, that a was, role that Slipknot. DC. Yeah, that was yeah, DC. DC, yeah, he took that role. And I was like, he could have saved that appearance, appearance for an actual native role, for a native, like a superhero movie for real. And he, spent, he took the money to be in a DC movie for three and a half seconds to play Slipknot, which is the most obscure character known to Christ. And well, and not only he that, DC, the way they portrayed him, his lines, all his lines were was he talked about how he hit a woman, so that made him an abuser, 
and then they killed him off. So that's the message uh, that DC was sending to the world about native superheroes or villains or whatever. Yes, he's a villain, so he's got to be mean. But why is the native guy the woman beater? Thanks, DC. Um, I'm walking down the road with the rest of the cast, like with a 40, you know what I mean? And a pack yeah, of yeah. Just go all the way with it, DC. <laughs> as long as I have been a comic book fan, I researched Slipknot when I found out he was going to be Slipknot because he, he put it out that he was going to be Slipknot. So I researched it, and he's the worst of the worst. And I don't mean like he was a super bad guy. He was just the most obscure, ridiculous comic book. Everything was about ropes. That was his superpower. He knew how to tie ropes. That was his whole superhero power was he knew how to tie fancy ropes. And so he was an evil boy scout? He was an evil scout. He was 17 in a good way. And he came across <laughs> a slip manual like that and he started flipping through. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, I was like, man, it would be nice to see, you know, a just, I want to, I don't know, I keep repeating myself, but I, I want to see I want my daughter to see where it's a, a movie or TV show where we have success. So it is a happy ending yeah. in the back, the bottom of it. Well, I want to say, you know, until we control the narrative, which is what Sterling and Taika are starting to do, and then self creators like your guy, you guys, you guys are cr uh, controlling the narrative here on your show. Uh, and that's what we're starting to understand about media. Until we control it, they're never going to look out. It's not. To be quite honest, it's not their responsibility to look out for our narrative. That's they right. created this platform, and that's great. If they're inviting us in, cool. Uh, I don't have to participate, but then if I don't participate, it's going to hurt my career. Uh, the the you know because before Reservation Dogs, I wasn't really getting much um, because I kept turning down roles, and my agent was getting really upset with me. And I said, I'm not, I'm not doing what I call leather and feather anymore. I'm not doing Westerns. Don't call me for Westerns. I will not do it. <coughs> and she wasn't very happy about that. Cause at the end of the day, agents want to make money. I get that, you know, and me pushing this moral imperative, it, it hurt me financially and it hurt my career and reservation dogs came just as. I wasn't quite sure if I was going to get anything else, you know, and it was the same thing for Sterling. Sterling was on his way out. He was applying at colleges for jobs. I had called him three months before this happened. And he had told me, cause I, I was like, are you doing any projects? Cause I want to work with you again. And he's like, dude, he goes, I can't do it. I, I got, I got a family. I have to support them. I got to go get a job. So he had started applying at colleges and then Taika unbeknownst to Sterling got him a deal at Hulu and um, Sterling didn't even know about it. And his agent called him and she was like, what's reservation dogs. And he's like, how did you know about that? <laughs> he's like, that's something Tyke and I were talking about. She goes, well, apparently you have a deal at Hulu. And he's like, what? And then his other line rings and it's Tyka. And he goes, let me talk to Tyka. So, and this is exactly what happened. I, I shit you not. Uh, Sterling answers the phone. And he's like, Taika. And then Taika's like, hey, I got your deal at Hulu, but I got to go. And then he <laughs> hangs up. <laughs> and three weeks later, Taika shows up. But for that three weeks, Sterling had to navigate with Hulu on this project, what he was going to do. Um, he had to start casting it. Um, and that, yeah, that was Taika, crazy Taika. And, uh, you know, but the cool thing is now it, Reservation Dogs proved to the white world that our stories have meaning. And the way we tell our stories, which is what they refer to as open-ended, right. people actually like. And people want to see Native stories by Natives. It's commercial now. And that's, for Hollywood, I can't say that they're racist because the only color they care about is green, money. And at the end of the day, it's a business. It's called show business. It's not called show art or show culture. It's show business. Show show yeah. It's not show uh, what do you mean? <laughs> so Taika and Sterling, 
very fortunate that, you know, the, the gamble paid off and this story has so much tremendous heart and it speaks to several communities, indigenous communities. You know, there's a Willie Jack in every reservation. We all know a little Willie Jack. We've all had an encounter with Willie Jack. <laughs> I, mean, I got a couple you know. of sisters that are Willie Jacks. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's great, you know, and for the first time in history, for the first time in history, reservation kids actually think they're cool. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's exactly I, I have, what you're talking about, man. I, I've been vamping on that shoot for I don't know how long, and that's not because... Oh, you know, Ron, you just never shut up or whatever. It's like, no, dude, I'm talking about us building ourselves up. And now that we have a, more of a, I mean, enough of a platform, we didn't, we haven't talked about Dallas Gold Tooth, his appearance. Oh, yeah. Dallas has always been funny. I mean, he's somebody that was out there mainlining at Standing Rock and doing daily video updates. Him and Tito Ibarra. Like, those people are personalities that I really like to watch. Ryan Redcorn's another one. Like, you wouldn't know unless you really looked at Ryan. It's almost like looking at me in the wintertime. You know what I mean? I'm brown in the summer, but not in the winter, dog. Ryan's one of like, holy shit. Oh, you are a skin. <laughs> oh, hey, you know what I mean? Like, wow, okay. But we do. We have enough of depth and breadth in our native world that we can, we can diversify. Like, you were talking about diversification. There's opportunities at building this out every single way. To me, I look at it like a, a, a native on the river in the Pacific Northwest. You can fish from the, the, the shoreline, but wouldn't you rather be right over the depths of the water where those fish are going to come right up to you? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're going to have to build That's your scaffold, right. bro. You, so you build that scaffold. Next thing you know, you're over the water like that. Next thing you know, boom, they're just jumping right in there. One after the other, boom, it's just like Salila Falls. There they are. This is one after the other. Next thing you know, you look up on shore and there's a thousand fish that are being cut and gutted by the grandmas and the aunties and the moms out there and the little sisters just doing that work. The success comes from everybody. Like you said, your message was very clear. We got to get away from the, no, this is only about me. You yeah. Know? And if we are incorporating New Zealanders, that can help us who have a, an identity that understands native first nations living in New Zealand, the Maori people, the Maoris, Marai, what that depends on which part of the Island you're on. You know what I mean? But that's what I want to see. I want to see us be able to reach out, bring up a story from back in the day, the tribal vo voice tour with Un uncle John Trudell. May he rest in peace. They were on tour all across the continent, going from place to place, city to city, res, res all of it. Yothu Yindi from Australia joins them, and their tour was called Tribal Voice. So the next thing you know, Tribal Voice tours, whoa, it was beefed up. And if you listen to Yothu Yindi, got to listen to your Tribal Voice. Listen to this music is so badass, and it's coming from Aboriginal natives out in Australia, and then the Aboriginal native voice of Turtle Island. You're going hell yeah! That's what I'm really seeing. This is the theme that I'm feeling from this right here added to that the success of your comic and the fact that we're starting to see people like sterling or dallas or tito or whoever 1491s in general we need more of that we need people like well, charlie hill representing on richard Pryor back in the day you know what i mean oh yeah charlie hill and i mean even today zon mclarenon zon mclarenon is uh the executive producer of dark winds which is unheard of a native american executive producer and Zahn is a hard was one is one of the hardest working actors in Hollywood. Uh, his resume is double the size of mine. That guy, I've I've known Zahn since the '90s, and amazing cat, amazing talent. And now he's got the ability to hire Native American actors to run his show that yeah. he's the star of now, which is amazing. I mean that that just it's so yeah. cool he's to see him there. Here, right? Hey, uh, yeah, he was in Longmire. Yeah. All right, let me pause for just a second for a word from our sponsors. That's as, right. always, as always, we have a great sponsor here on the show called Scolding.xyz. It is an indigenous owned and run operated uh, Facebook type of website. It's a social media platform for native people. Instead of using Facebook, you can go over to Scolding.xyz and it's all native people, exact same format as Facebook, except it's all Indian people. So uh, our our show tonight and every night is 
brought to you by uh, scolding.xyz. You can find the app on your Play Store and on your on on Apple and on Android. It's the Medicine Wheel, the Sacred Colors as a symbol. Come on in. It's free to join. Uh, share all your things you're doing. Uh, connect with other Native people, other Native artists, other Native uh, directors, and uh, come on over. Powwows, round dances, potlatch. You guys are setting up a wiki up, you know what I mean? Kothla and Ola need you to put up the teepee longhouse like that. You guys got fry bread cook-off going on on the res. You guys got an Indian taco sale. You're sponsoring a memorial special at Lincoln's Birthday Powwow or Payumsha or Seneca Nation Windstar World Resort down there. And uh, what's that? Uh, oh, my gosh. Now I'm messing up. In, in Oklahoma, right off of Interstate 35, Windstar World Resort. Oh, my God. I'm going to remember their tribe any time now. <laughs> you guys are Kiowa, Comanche, Kickapoo, Sac and Fox, Quillia, Queets, Quinault, Ho, Macaw, Winnebago. Are you guys Ho-Chunk, Chippewa Cree? Are you Chinook, right? Are you Kath Lamet, Skamakwa? Skoden.xyz is your place. And don't forget, we're going to put a link and a portal on there so we can get Tribal Force Comics on Skoden. We want to make sure to get John to come over there and yes, sign up for an account. I don't know. Yes, you're a single father, so this might be an anti-festival. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> and it he's from Utah, so it's warm down there. If you guys are looking to That's relocate, it. Yeah. <laughs> hey John, are you are you thinking about putting your comics also also in digital form? Yeah, we are uh, actually. On Kickstarter, the lowest amount you can donate is like I think five dollars, and you get a digital copy of the comic. There you All right, go. Fantastic. We want to make sure we posting stick games on there too, Patrick. I seen that he's gonna put stick games on Scoding XYZ. We also want to promote your show over on uh, Scoding XYZ because it's all native, all day, all the time. So we want to make sure native people realize there's this platform. I have a lot of native teachers now that are members of Scoding XYZ. And they're always looking for literature for more native written and directed stuff. I mean, that's right. Then your comic book is right down that line. So we definitely want to put it over there. We were, we are going to work our ass off to make your comic book a humongous success in every way we can. That's right. Hey, yeah. if you want merchandise, where are we going, buddy? Is there a um, Ooh, t-shirts uh, with Rebel Force would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. we do. We, we have t-shirts. We have T-shirts right now. If you go to machinecomics.com, and that's comics with an X, we do sell shirts there. Uh, we obviously want to do action figures and different things like that. Uh, it's just finding the people that can do it and then, of course, the money. <laughs> We've got the money. As a matter of fact, Jacob Faithful, Young Spirit Singers, Grammy-nominated Young Spirit Singers, has an amazing wow. printing press up there in Alberta. Those guys, his work is tremendous. They do uh, uh, silk screen as well oh, as digital nice. print. So there is an opportunity. What, like we were talking about tribal businesses earlier. Jacob Faithful, if you're listening right now, I want you to listen to Uncle. Hey, no. <laughs> but I want to oh. be able to do that if we can get you some T-shirts printed off and start selling them, yeah. man. And here in New York, we have a action figure uh, thing in our mall that you can literally go and get 3D scanned. Just like this, get a three, get your body and, and whatever you're wearing, your regalia. I don't know it's, if I want my body. <laughs> oh, come on, Bob, picture over there. <laughs> it's it's a gift my daughter got me for Christmas. So I went over to the mall in full regalia, and they oh, put you oh, in a wow, thing wow, and they wow. scan you all around. And for the big models, for the ones that have articulated arms, it's like a hundred twenty bucks. Uh, for wow. for one of them, but I always wanted myself as an action figure because, like I said, I'm a geek, and that's what she got me for Christmas. And I'm waiting for it to come in the mail because it takes a few months for it to even, uh, get get through getting done. But it's a professional action figure, and any you have to go over there dressed in any way you want to be dressed, and they turn you into an action figure. So yeah. it'd be cool to get a 3D rendering of some of your characters. If all they yeah. need is a, a picture of the front, a picture of the back, and the size of the character. And they can make a 3D uh, action figure of it. Uh oh, dun dun dun! You see, you see how he pointed like an Indian just then too. Yeah. <laughs> so I want uh, John. When we get off here tonight, I want you to send me every link to all this stuff. 
That's right. right. I am going to do a major posting on on this site here, our BNB Indigenous Podcast on the Skoda XYZ. And I have a couple more sites that I'm in touch with people also because we're going to spread the word about this. And I have my teachers out there that I'm going to see if we can get cases of these comic books bought when they come out. See if we get cases of these comic books bought for these schools. Because I have about 12 different schools on my personal Facebook that stay in contact with me. And if I can get a funding for these schools to start buying cases of comic books, they have them low put in their schools. What a great, that'd be great for you and also great for them more importantly. Yeah, well, no, I'm, definitely. I'm, I'm going to have my kids adopt this guy as their online dad too. You know what I mean? Like in a good way. <laughs> my bro says he's going to, he needs that action figure. So. John, you've got to, you got to go get the 3D print. Me, no. <laughs> yes, no. But I'm going to go. I I will. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like the show, if you like what we're doing, please like and subscribe. Please share this video. We need to get the word out here about John's stuff. This is so important. I'm I'm fanboying. I've over talked Ron like seven different times now, and I don't, you know. But I'm super excited because comics is down my alley, movies are down my alley. I'm so like diverse in that stuff, and I'm I get a little head of myself, especially when I have somebody that I've kind of watched through all my years of watching TV and watching movies. So, like I said, I'm so happy and proud and honored that you decided to be on the show. And are you? Oh, my question is, are you taking? Um, anybody's help and suggestions or what are you gleaning the people for ideas on, on, on for, content for the comic or for, for any, uh, other well, thing? I've been, I've been doing this since 96. So I've had stories floating through my head since 1996 and I've got eight written scripts, you know, eight issues written already in my head. And I, you know, I've kind of got an idea where I want tribal force to go. Um, you know, I, I grew up reading Savage Sword of Conan, the magazine, and Vampirella. And as a child, very young child, six, seven, eight years old, I was attracted to the things I wasn't supposed to be attracted to. I was attracted to hyperviolence, sexuality, uh, you know, those things. You know, Conan and Vampirella, one of the highlights was when, you know, somebody wasn't wearing a top. <laughs> <laughs> that was my only exposure, you know. Our first, porn, uh, our first porn, our first porn. Yes. And, you know, or if somebody got their head chopped off and all the blood came out. And I love that stuff as a kid. And I want Tribal Force to have pieces of that in there. I, Tribal Force is not a child friendly comic book of, of any. Uh, because we do talk, you know, the main character is a survivor of child molestation and we deal with that subject matter. Now that's not every single issue. We're going to be talking about that, but it does come up. It's important. There was one year on, uh, the reservations out here, we had seven deaths in a year's time and all those deaths could be connected. They were suicide, uh, and they could be connected to child molestation. And that was a part that drove me to create this character of Nita uh, for tribal force, because I wanted to create a hero for these little girls that are opting for suicide because they think that's the answer. I wanted to create a character that was always going to be dealing with that. It's not sunshine and rainbows and rivers made out of chocolate. Uh, you know, it's, it's about coping with something that has happened to you. And it was important to me to create a character that these little girls could look up to. Uh, and hopefully make the decision not to commit suicide, hopefully make the decision to talk to a counselor or an, uh, uh, an adult and say, hey, this character is just like me. This happened to me because that's the most important thing is starting that conversation because it's hard. It's hard for young women. And I've I've run into women in their 30s, in their 40s that have never dealt with that. The first time they talked about it was with me. Because when they heard that I was creating a character that dealt with that, they felt it was so important that they wished they had had a character like that when they were kids. So, you know, Tribal Force has many layers of responsibility and importance. And I hope, I mean, you know, it's so scary. You know, we're in that age of the, the cancel culture. And uh, if I offend somebody or if I, but I, I'm 56, so I don't care if I offend anyone. I'm doing what I'm doing 
I'm doing this for the kids. I'm doing this to combat child molestation. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I hope tribal force makes money. That would be great. And if it doesn't, and we can still produce it, we're going to do it. Um, you know, I'm gonna yeah. Send you so, produce it because I think to me, that's the way that it should be. If it's a message that is clear, coherent and helps stabilize our community in a way it's like going into a sweat. It's the same thing. You know that if there's somebody there that can help doctor you up, <coughs> it's important that you're there. Whether it's a comic yeah. book, whether it's an elder's conversation, or somebody that just asks you to listen and tune into what they're saying because they're giving you some lessons that will help you in your life, it's necessary, man. And what that what what this is to me is exactly what is needed in our communities because 556 suicides on this on this continent from our native people in 2022 speaks volumes of what's going on and why we need to level the playing field when it comes out there putting these positive peer advisors and role models into those positions so you're absolutely yeah. right and if you're if you're if uh, now listen I'm an east coast native we get forgotten forgotten about by other tribal nations so at any yeah. time your tribal force wants to introduce a East Coast native, a Haudenosaunee, a Mohawk, the Anasaksia, the Tuscarora, uh, the Lumbees over here. You let me know. I got a couple characters. I know I can send your way. You to represent the Longhouse people. That's right. He's yeah, I've He's got. With him too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm trying to develop. You know, because every character is from a different tribe and tribal force. Uh, Nita, like I said, is uh, half Yoema, half Dene. Uh, little Bighorn is Hunk Papa Sue. Thunder Eagle is a god, so he doesn't necessarily have a tribe. Uh, but he is, he has the, uh, the, the ghost dance symbol on his shirt, which was made by the Paiute medicine man, Waboka. Yeah. Um, Jaguar Knight is from, he's actually a couple of hundred years old. He's from, uh, as the Aztec age in Mexico. Uh, and then we have other characters, we have Adi, which, a lot of people don't see him a lot, but he's there. He's the the wooden thunderbird. He's quite cute. He's from uh, an Alaskan tribe. Uh, so I'm trying, you know, we're going to introduce other characters from, you know, different tribes. I just want to make sure that they're representative of that tribe. Not yeah. only representative culturally, but at, you know how different reservations have different vernaculars. You have different sayings on different re reservations or yeah. some reservations you go to, they always click at the end. You're like, eh, hey, you know, or, yeah. uh, you know, huh? So oh, there's, okay. things that, okay. <laughs> there's things that, there's things that I want to make sure that there's contemporary references to those tribes as well. And that takes well, a lot of research. Well, I do. I'm so happy we're talking about this because I forgot to talk about this. This was sent to me by the first, this is a comic book, the first Aztec-based comic book made by Aztec uh, descendants. Oh, yeah. What is it? Oh, oh that's so I awesome. I've seen, <laughs> seen that before, uh, Patrick. I can, send you a, I can send you a copy of this, John. This is, he yeah. sent me like nine copies that, to give out. Wow. So I have, I have the first chapter. The artwork, if I can show you, the artwork is... Oh, nice. The oh, yeah. The artwork is fantastic. The storylines are great. They're all Aztec gods that are protectors of the Aztec people. That's right, baby. And this is all, this is the first of its kind, just like yours. But this is covering the Aztec gods and the beliefs. So I can, I can send you a copy of this. I got like nine copies. Yeah, please. please. Yeah, it is fantastic. Yeah, it's called The Aztec Warrior God, number, uh, Chapter 1, The Emergency. Yeah, no, I love that. I, You know, my tribe, we're originally from Mexico. We're from Hermosillo, Mexico. Uh, we fought our way up into Arizona. We fought the Mexicans. We fought the Federales. We fought the Apache. We fought the local tribe here, <laughs> and then we made our home here. But we, our tribe came from a tribe called the Toltecs, and the Toltecs were referred to from the other tribes as the communicators because supposedly we were the only ones who could speak with the star people. And this is what other tribes called us. We didn't call ourselves that. The other tribes called us 
uh, the communicators because we they saw us speaking with the star people. And the star people are the gods, you know, the gods that walked amongst us. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping Tribal Force encapsulates all that. It's, it's a big, you know, it's a challenge because you only got so many pages per issue. And I want it to be a good comic book, but I also want it to have these pearls of wisdom in there every so often, you know. Wow. I mean, I'm just, we, we lost, we lost a uh, Ron there for a second. He'll be back here. Yeah, I guess okay. he you know, Ron is my uh, mobile guy. He's a truck driver, so he's always on the road. So he's always got an issue with try making sure he's got his internet going and stuff. So this happens every so often. But man, I'm just I'm kind of just blown away. I I love everything we talked about. So what got what got you into acting? I mean, you've been acting since the '80s. Yeah, I had always wanted to do it. You know, because of Jay Silverhills and Will Sampson. Uh, those were my biggest influences, and I was so fascinated by movies, and it was my grandmother um, who basically, I thought it was real. I thought everything I was watching on TV was real, and then I saw an actor get killed in a show, and then I saw him in another show, so I was a little confused, and I asked my grandmother, I think I was about four, and she explained to me, she goes, no, it's like, she goes, when you go outside and you play with your friends, you're playing, right? And I said, yeah. And she goes, that's what they're doing. That's their job. And when she said that, I was like, it's a job? <laughs> like, wow. And then, you know, as I got older, hearing the way, you know, when I would tell people, like, I want to work in the movies. And they're like, oh, well, you're, you're Indian or you're native and they're not going to hire you unless it's a John Wayne movie and they're killing you. And you start to hear all these prejudices, even amongst your own people. Uh, I think my worst critics were my own people uh, just saying, you know, kind of looking at me like, who the hell do you think you are? And you don't look like them and they're not going to put, you know, everything that you hear from the naysayers. So um, I started sneaking on to movie sets in Tucson and figuring out, OK, the guys with the walkie talkies seemed to be important. So I found the truck where they had the walkie talkies and I swiped the walkie talkie and started walking around like I knew what I was doing and I would help out. And eventually somebody figured out I wasn't working for the company and they're like, you want a job? And I'm like, yeah. And uh, so that's how I started to get educated on movies. And then when Young Guns 2 came into town, I, uh, a friend of mine who owned the porta potty business, he called me and said, Hey, we just got a huge order from a company, uh, called Morgan Creek. And they're doing a movie called young guns Two, And their offices are at this hotel. So I went to the hotel and I bribed the, the maids to tell me where the casting director was staying. And then I had to bribe the security guards with coffee and donuts every night. Uh, so he'd let me stay outside of this, this guy's room until he showed up. And he showed up one morning, like at four in the morning and woke me up. I was asleep at his door. He thought I was just probably some big drunk Indian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, hey, I want to be in Young Guns too," and blah, blah, blah. And he was just trying to get rid of me. He's like, I just want to get in my room. I've been driving all night. And I said, listen, buddy, you're either going to give me a job or you're going to have to call the cops. And... Uh, <laughs> He was, you know, he was scared and because I'm, I'm a big guy, comparatively speaking to him. And uh, he was like, are you you're serious? You, you'll get arrested. And I go, yeah, I go, I'm leaving with handcuffs or a job. And he's like, I can't pay you. And I said, well, I'll work for food. Can you feed me? And he just said, fine, fine, I'll feed you. Just show up here tomorrow at eight in the morning which I did. And uh, so for three weeks, I worked for him just getting paid in food. And then I met Lou Diamond Phillips and Lou really liked my hair. I had waist length hair at the time. And uh, so Lou had my hair copied onto his because his hair was only down to like, you know, his neckline. And then when the director saw us together, he was like, oh, my God, you guys could be brothers. Uh, they offered me the job of uh, stunt double and writing double for Lou Diamond Phillips and Young Guns 2. And uh, I went from working for food to getting paid, like, I think I was getting paid 375 a day, which was enormous for me. Lots of money. Yeah. Yeah, lots of money. And uh, they were like, can you ride a horse? And I was like, yeah, I was born on a horse. And 
I had never touched a horse in my life. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so it's in my DNA. So. Yeah. Uh, so I had to do I had to do a riding test, and uh, I went early to watch all the cowboys ride, and I kind of figured it out, and I fooled the LA casting people. And the one head wrangler, a guy named Jack Lilly, he walks up to me and he's like, you ain't never rid a horse in your life. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So he said, he goes, if you show up here every morning at six in the morning and help us unload the horses, I'll teach you how to ride. And uh, and he did. And subsequently, he was actually the guy who taught John Wayne how to ride. Um and uh really great guy jack lilly wrangler real no nonsense guy he hated hollywood types uh but he's the one who really taught me how to handle a horse and take care of a horse and uh, i went on to work on the film it was my first big hollywood movie and i got to be around all these movie stars of the time you know and i met john fusco the writer and i i wanted to write movies and i was working on a screenplay and I gave John Fusco, the writer of Young Guns 2, uh, I gave him my screenplay. And it was probably the biggest pile of crap ever. And the next day he came to me and the first question he asked me was, uh, did you ever graduate from high school? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, why? And he goes, yeah, I can tell. He goes, your command of the English language is horrible. Uh, so he wrote out a list of books for me to read, which I read from cover to cover. And, you know, he gave me a lot of good advice and he made sure I was uh, I would go to meetings for production that only the higher ups were allowed to go to because John wanted me to see how movies got made. So that was my first experience in film, you know, and John Fusco was very responsible for that, that he made the effort. He saw something in me, Uh, even though I was getting in trouble a lot on movie sets. I was getting in fights. I, I stole a car. There was a motorcycle gang that wanted to kill me. Uh, <laughs> I, I got, I got, I got busted for making counterfeit young guns, two t-shirts and selling them. Uh, I was getting in all kinds of trouble, but Fusco, for whatever reason, he saw something in me. Uh, and even the director, the director said that if I would stay out of trouble for two weeks, he would let me direct a scene in the movie. And so for two weeks, I stayed out of trouble, didn't do anything bad. Uh, he let me direct one scene in Young Guns 2. And it was amazing. It was like, man, if I had ever done drugs, I think that's what it would have felt like uh, directing a movie scene. I got to direct Emilio Estevez. And one quick scene in the movie and the director, you know, he pats me on my back and he's like, you, you know, you're, you're going to be able to do something in this business. Just stay out of trouble. <laughs> and uh, so that was like a very seminal experience for me. That movie, I was very young. I was 23 years old. I had a daughter on the way. Uh, but there was something, you know, the, the, those experiences made me think I, I might have a future in this business. So we'll see. <laughs> Wow, what a story, man. Oh, my God, what a story. I, uh, I dropped tobacco at Billy the Kid's grave there in New Mexico. Oh, wow. A lot of people were like, you did that? I'm like, well, if you know anything about the real Billy the Kid, like, he was he was about his people. He might not have yeah. been about all the people, but he was standing up against a group of tyrants in that area at the time that were trying to literally monopolize on that entire portion of southeastern New Mexico. And yeah. John Tunstall and and uh you know who else was it? It was uh Pat Garrett. You know, a lot of these people like that, they were they were dirty. I mean and if you know anything about quasi law enforcement back in those days, that was a really horrible situation because most of those guys were hired guns that would have worked both sides of the fence. They didn't care if they were working for law yeah. enforcement or the red well Republican. Billy the kid the Billy the Kid story wasn't necessarily about Billy the Kid. It was the end of an era. Uh, law was a whole new concept. That, like a sheriff and law, that was new. That was a new thing. They had to explain it to people that if this happens, you have to come to the sheriff. You can't just shoot the guy. You can't just go hang them. And everybody was very confused about it out here in Arizona and Arizona Territory, New Mexico. I mean, that, that sounded ridiculous to them. 
They were like, so wait a minute. I see a guy stealing my horse, and instead of shooting him, I got to go into town and tell you, and then you got to, like, gather some guys together, and we got to go look for the dude that I could have just shot, you know, 10 feet outside my house. And they thought it was just stupid. They didn't think it was going to work. They were like, this isn't going to last very long. So, unfortunately, Billy was on the tail end of that. You know, when he was breaking the law, he was still following the law of the land, the law of the West. That's right. But that that didn't... All the other guy that they said that they thought might have been his character in in the living flesh, that yeah, you know, because Pat Garrett was supposedly the one that killed him. People were like, "No, you didn't." You know, that's Brushy Bill Roberts telling the true story, and that was the, you know, the buildup. Like, I watch Young Guns, I, the series of Young Guns, like over and over and over and over again. I thought for sure if I, you know, wouldn't have been with the woman I have, you know, I have now. I'd have been with a little Asian gal because of Kiefer Sutherland. <laughs> I said, uh, it's funny what you said about the, the horse riding. My wife was an actress and she said something similar to what you just said. She goes, when they ask you, you can do something. The answer is <laughs> always yes. yes. She goes, I don't care yes. what it is. She did a, she did a role in um, the angriest man in Brooklyn with uh, Robin Williams. Yeah. And she, they asked her if she could speak Spanish. My my wife is Okanichi Saponi. She didn't, can't speak a lick of Spanish. But she learned how to say, I think, nine phrases. Yeah. And, and, and nine phrases as clear as she could just to say it in it, because that's what she was playing. She was playing like, uh, in, she was playing one of the patients in the Insane Asylum where uh, <laughs> Rob Williams was, and she had to speak a little Spanish in it. And she was like, yeah, hey, uh, you, when they asked you what you can do, you can do everything. If they say yeah. you can walk on the moon, you can walk on the moon. So which how funny is that you said, you said, yes, I can ride a horse. Absolutely. I was born on one. So totally sound like my wife. And she was like, <laughs> when I started writing my screenplay, she goes, listen, no is going to be your biggest friend. So what do you mean? You're going to get 9 billion no's, but you're always waiting for that one yes. So yeah. be prepared to hear no a lot. So. It's kind of funny just hearing you say it. Kind of rem- makes me remember her. Well, that's good to hear what you were talking about about them letting you direct. See, I think there's yeah. a lot of people out there that have a different eye for things. Like I was watching the story of Steven Spielberg, Steven, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas pre Star Wars, pre development of ET, all of these things. And but when you listen to, you know, they already had an idea. Like the what was that um, movie that just came out? Uh, it's it's basically a biography about Steven Spielberg. They gave it a oh yeah, the Fablemans. The Fablemans. Fable watch that movie. He already knew I've what he was it. doing by the time he would. Yeah, it's awesome. You should. It's it's an excellent movie. It, it's totally a period piece, but it was so awesome to see the development of his ability to, first of all, run a camera and direct a crew of people. It was all kids in his Boy Scout troop. Talking about yeah. the Eagle Scout patch, you know what I mean? But I thought, you know, he came up with ways he evolutionized an idea about, well, how did you get those flashes to make it look like real bullet shots? And he was popping <laughs> holes in the film with a hot needle. So when you when the film would pass through that section like that, and you see them all getting blasted with the fake guns, boom, 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 boom. And it looked <laughs> like real gunshots. You're like, wow, look at that. That, to me, is something that I see that I think if we give the kids the opportunity, if we did some sort of a film summit or something where they could actually glean a lot of these actors and actresses. Not that I want Hollywood. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of dirtiness. We A lot of people don't know that. Uh, Hollywood yeah. has some really dark, dark, sinister sides to it that people just don't know. And I tell that as a, as a warning, but I also think it's important for our kids to be able to show what they got hell even if it comes to telling stories and we have something like that and we bring that in concert with a three-day comic yeah. event in the native community you know we're some of the best storytellers in history i feel yeah. i mean we have i mean i come from i'm a fourth generation storyteller i tell the stories of my ancestors stories that were passed down by my grandfather and his grandfather and so on and so forth we have some amazing stories that i mean if hollywood could even under I think the closest I've seen is Dreamkeeper. Dreamkeeper took a bunch of different stories of different tribes and brought them to life. And I was like, 
watching the story of Quill Work Girl and her seven brothers. Oh, wow. oh my God, that was fantastic. Or seeing how uh, um, Thunder Boy was created, how Thunder Boy here on the East Coast, the Mohawk Thunder Boy was created. And seeing these stories with the money put behind it to make the special effects. Oh my God. I never felt so proud. I think I've made my kids watch it 30 times and it's a two hour, it's a two and a half hour movie, but I, my kids are like, not this again, dad. Are you watching this again? Absolutely. I'm watching this again. Yeah, my mom's it's in love with the, the, with the, the thunder beings. Uh, well, sky Woman's son, she's been in love with him since like those. The, yeah. The thunder being. Yeah. <laughs> So what are you what are you working for the new one? So what are you working on now, John? What are you what, what are we going to be looking forward to? Uh well, I've got I have three films out right now. Um one of them is called just is going to be released in I, I think he's doing festivals. It's called Sendero. Really yeah. good movie about loss, about this man who loses his wife in a school shooting. Uh another one is uh Blood Relatives which is available on oh my god i forgot where it's available uh it's a horror platform um oh you're talking oh i already know what you're talking about i have that it's called um oh i just had a tip of my thing uh, yeah it's uh, right there well it's called blood relatives uh that's out right now and then a uh, year of the dog is another movie i'm very proud of it's being it's unlimited release but i think it's they're going to be on a platform it's soon on, it's on amazon right now for three dollars and 57 cents yeah yeah uh that was a really good film and i got to be around michael spears who's awesome love michael spears we actually have the same agent um and then I'm trying to think and i've got three other projects coming out this year uh, I'm just waiting to hear from them so we'll, I can start talking about them. Um, so I, from Reservation Dogs, I got I basically got seven movies from Reservation Dogs, being on Reservation Dogs, which was awesome. Uh, and those will all be, all of them will be coming out this year. And then, of course, Tribal Force is what we're doing now. And uh, I'm getting ready. Uh, hopefully, we'll start season three. We'll start shooting season three of Reservation Dogs pretty soon. We'll see. Oh, where, where can we find Deep Woods? I'm sorry. Yeah, Deep Woods is also on Apple. Um, I'm trying to think what else, um, where else Deep Woods is. Um, uh, I'm so horrible with these platforms. Uh, but yeah, Deep Deep Woods was another good film. I, all of them. I'm, I'm really happy and fortunate I was cast in these films and these projects, and I got the opportunity to do them. They're all contemporary projects couple of horror films uh which is new to me i've never been into horror but now that i've been in a couple of horror films I'm, they're pretty fun to make yeah the special effects that goes behind it like i I'm, I'm big on horror since i was a kid actually two years in a row i was freddy krueger i actually cut the mask <laughs> into pieces and 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 spirit gummed it to my face and you know i even shut her Shutter, that's it. Shutter is I have the damn app. I pay for the service and I can't remember oh. the name of it. It's called Shutter. It's it's all horror all the time. I think yeah. they also yeah. have the native zombie movie on there too. Uh, um yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think it's called Full Blood. On I think it's called Full Blood. It's a native zombie movie on there, which was produced and written by native people as well. I like that. Well, Blood yeah. Blood a damn good title buddy blood quantum yeah. that's the name of the movie blood quantum oh blood quantum yeah i've heard of that one uh that's, that's the yeah. native zombie movie we need to put him in touch but, with Gene bennett as, as well too you know you want to talk about putting some minds together for, for writing and and opportunities to make something that i think would really i always think because i talk about movies every day in my own mind or with other people or use movies for things that i understand in life yeah, but if you could take little bits and pieces here and there and everywhere, you know what I mean, and and you'll see some actors they'll stay in character. They won't leave that character profile until the end of the movie or the series that they're doing. Narcos is a fine example of that. I always talk about Heath Ledger playing Joker, like, and it put him in a downward spiral mentally. He had to go to therapy for that. He, you know, dealt with all sorts of different stuff. But I'm saying character development, the opportunity for people to 
hone different crafts or parts of that craft and put it together to make one kick-ass story, you know what I mean? Well, I yeah, and that's, just, that's always been an issue with hiring Native actors. You know, the casting directors would say that we don't have the appropriate talent, but then it went back to that Catch-22. It's like, well, you're not giving us the opportunity to build our ability, and now that we're being on TV series as actors and writers and directors, the industry won't be able to say that anymore. They won't be able to say you don't have enough experience or you haven't directed a TV series or a show. Uh, Sterling and Taika are now creating those opportunities and opening those doors for us. Um, so it's cool. It's cool to finally be in the show, be in the game. And it, it's giving Hollywood one less of a, of a reason not to hire us. So they can't say, well, you guys don't have, you haven't developed your skill yet. Well, now we are. Right. And, and that's where we're, that's where we're finding ourselves right now more than anything. I know a lot of people want to know, my brother was just asking Blu-rays, DVDs, and this is coming to the point where right now we're, uh, we're getting towards the end. We're going to wrap up the show today, but we want to, to make sure and bring you back, John. It's been wonderful. Yeah, definitely. You know, a lot of people are, are, you know, like like my, my cousin Fabian said, what a dream it would be to get a breakout like that in the film industry. He's absolutely right. <laughs> so many people out there that we haven't seen that could diversify, yeah. as you would put it. it. This platform that we're looking at now, now we do have street cred, bro. Yeah, we have the meat and potatoes, but now comes the little, the last little p bits and pieces, <laughs> like mine's putting it all together. We look forward to making sure and getting this message out there. We want to remember to mention Skoden.xyz one last time, one of our biggest yeah. sponsors. And you guys, if you guys did not know, I'm telling you what, this is the place that you want to go and sign up for an account, okay? Because Skoden.xyz is one of those places that you could just be a native. You know what I mean? Like I said, you want to advertise powwows, round dances. you got a, a native entrepreneurial enterprise that you would like to share with us we want to hear about it you are a tribal casino you got commercials you want to share on skoden.xyz hell yeah you got merchandise or you guys are t-shirt providers and manufacturers we want to put you in touch with john proudstar we want to make sure to get that merchandise out there for natives by natives and selling to our native peoples and beyond whoever wants an awesome spam warrior t-shirt or fry bread king t-shirt we want to make sure and do that we really appreciate everybody coming on tonight joining us on the bnb &B indigenous podcast if you guys like what you see make sure to like share 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 like share and subscribe uh i'm gonna rap like homeboy did in reservation dogs about fry bread i'm gonna get on there my mine's gonna be cold-blooded though you know what i'm saying it's gonna be cold-blooded we'll get john to do a 16 bar verse on there for us too Ladies and gentlemen, make sure if you have any questions for John, make sure you type them down. Even after the show, we'll send them out to John. We're going to stay in contact with John at all times because we want to continue to promote his comic book and everything that he does because he does more than just comic books. He also promotes his work. He also wants to educate, and we want to make sure we show him as much love and support him in every single way that we can. So if you have questions, send them to us. We'll send them out to John. John, I'm on, I want to get your address to send you out this comic book. I know you'll love it to death. It's a fantastic story. Um, man, this has been an amazing show. And uh, with that being said, I just want to say good night to everybody. As your yeah. indigenous brother from another mother representing the B&B Indigenous Podcast, good night. Be blessed. Peace. And don't forget, hey. don't forget my friend's request, John. <laughs> Yo, peace. <laughs>